Dr. Peter Klein is professor and department chair at Baylor University, USA. He has his PhD from University of California at Berkeley. And as I mentioned to you in, in my earlier presentation, he has very strong grounding in economics, which is one of the mother disciplines of, of entrepreneurship research. Uh, his research interests are quite varied, as you'll see from this slide and also his publication record. His work has appeared in several top journals in the field, uh, including uh, you know, the entrepreneurship journals, including the top management journals, and including economics journals. He's also the co-editor at Strategic Entrepreneurship Journal. And on a personal note, I have known Peter for about 18 or 19 years now. And I continue to learn from him even to this day. And he, I, I continue to be amazed by the research he does. Um, so with that, I present to you, Dr. Peter Klein. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vishal, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll share my slides. I think you need to give me permission. Oh yeah, there we go, okay. Okay, great. Can you see the slides, everybody? Oh, whoops, sorry, mistake. Hold on just one second. Uh, what the heck is, sorry, I pulled up the wrong file. Give me just one second. So uh, people just getting started notice that even more experienced presenters can make silly mistakes like the one I just made. Uh, okay. Let's try this again. Okay, can, you can see in here okay? Perfect, okay, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, it's a, a pleasure to get to speak to all of you today and uh, you've already gotten quite a bit of developmental information uh, from the, the previous conversations. I'll try to add a little, a little bit more to that. I'll tell you more specifically about some of the recent work that I've been doing, uh, but again, this is really more to sort of whet your appetite uh, and maybe stimulate some discussion that we can have uh, during our Q&A period. As has already been mentioned, the entrepreneurship field is a, a very vibrant, diverse, and exciting field with lots of different approaches and theories and models. And uh, I think that's an advantage to those who are um, just getting started in this research area, but can, it can also be a bit challenging and that it's hard to get sort of a, a comprehensive overview of the field uh, in a very short period of time because it is so diverse. Um, I'm going to talk to you in particular about uh, a, an approach that I've been pursuing, what I call the judgment-based approach to entrepreneurship, but again, in the context of what's going on in the field more generally. So I guess you've already had some conversations uh, during uh, in the previous session about sort of the field as a whole. Um, it is a growing, rapidly growing field within management, uh, economics, public policy, sociology, and so forth. Um, you know, you can see that just looking institutionally at the landscape of the entrepreneurship research community. You know, almost every university around the world has some courses or a program or a center, maybe an academic major, a minor, or even a doctoral degree specializing in entrepreneurship. There's an increasing amount of research funding from various public and private entities to support entrepreneurship studies. We have quite a few journals with very high impact factors devoted to entrepreneurship topics and uh, even the general interest journals are devoting more and more of their uh, space to uh, phenomena related to entrepreneurship. Number of organizations, the Entrepreneurship Division of the Academy of Management is one such organization that promotes and sponsors entrepreneurship scholarship. You know, an interesting question uh, that maybe we can discuss a bit more in the q and a if, if you're interested is you know is why this is happening, right? What explains the growth of interest in entrepreneurship? Um, you know, is it uh, a change in public policy? In other words, a recognition by policymakers that if we want to promote uh, increases in economic growth, if we want to promote technological improvement and more generally improvement in human well-being, uh, entrepreneurship is a key driver of those things, and therefore we need to understand it better so we can figure out how to promote it. That's one possible cause. Of course, you know, within journalism and sort of pop culture, there's much more interest in 
entrepreneurship. When I was a kid, you know, there were no Shark Tank type shows on TV. Now every country has some version of, you know, a pitch contest. We're all deeply interested in the tech sector and everybody wants to be the next, well, I don't know, next Elon Musk or next Jeff Bezos or next uh, Mark Zuckerberg. I'm not sure exactly what, uh, what it would be uh, where you come from. But young people today know what entrepreneurship is. They're very interested in it. So it stands to reason that we as academics would want to devote more attention to understanding this thing that is an increasingly important part of our culture. But I think there are also some internal drivers, and I'll return to this point in just a moment, namely uh, among people in, you know, in economics, sociology, psychology, management, finance, et cetera, that there is, um, you know, a recognition that we need to understand certain phenomena better, right? So we believe intellectually that uh, the sorts of phenomena associated with entrepreneurship, startup companies and private equity and IP and so forth, that these are more important in our economy and society, uh, but also that there's something missing in our sort of standard or mainstream theories about businesses, about markets, about HR, about finance, about accounting, that they're somehow too static, uh, too, um, too based on equilibria, and we need to somehow understand a more dynamic, vibrant um, you know, approach to these things. We need to embrace uh, the sorts of theories and methods associated with entrepreneurship studies to understand firms and markets and other mundane phenomena a little bit better. You know, this, this last point really encapsulates my own sort of intellectual journey in, in becoming an entrepreneurship research scholar. I, I didn't start out studying entrepreneurship. I uh, was an undergraduate student in economics and later a PhD student in economics, as uh, Vishal mentioned. I did my training at UC Berkeley, where I studied with Oliver Williamson, who's very well known and, and later a Nobel laureate uh, in the study of institutions and organizations. So my uh, initial research program dealt with uh, questions of um, how companies organize themselves, whether firms should make or buy, how companies should be governed and so forth, L looking mainly at uh, you know, incumbent firms, existing firms, rather than new firms or startup companies. But I always had an interest in some sort of heterodox or non-standard approaches uh, to understanding these things. I was influenced by the so-called Austrian School of Economics and also evolutionary or Schumpeterian approaches to understanding economic phenomena. So I was sort of open to non-traditional uh, understandings and approaches. And uh, you know, I became increasingly dissatisfied with the, the, the highly static and sort of overly formalistic approaches to, uh, you know, that dominate most of what uh, economists uh, do when they're studying industries and competition and so forth. Uh, Overemphasis on equilibrium, on understanding sort of, uh, sort of solving narrow technical problems without understanding the bigger picture of, you know, where companies come from and where industries, how industries emerge and, uh, you know, why, why is this market that we're studying using these formalistic tools, why is it there? Well, why did this market come to exist? Who, who caused this market or this technology or this set of firms or this industries to exist? These were questions that were really outside the standard models in economics. But as I said, I had this idiosyncratic interest. Some of it was sort of um, not entirely serendipitous, but, but difficult to plan ex ante. I, get involved, I got involved even as a PhD student in an editing project that ended up with me being an editor of one of the volumes of the collected works of F.A. Hayek. Hayek is a famous, was a famous Austrian school economist. And I got to know many people who were Hayek scholars and of course got to know Hayek's own writings very well through this work that I did as a PhD student. Um, now, that led me to looking at the entrepreneurship literature, but I also found myself dissatisfied with some of the leading approaches in the entrepreneurship literature, in particular, the so-called opportunity discovery approach, about which I'll say more in just a moment. Um, I, you know, I had sort of a fairly um, standard and unremarkable career, I guess. I was a professor at several different universities. 
Uh, I came to Baylor University in 2015 to join the entrepreneurship program. Baylor has a very strong specialized entrepreneurship program with its own department, its own major and minor. We have a PhD in entrepreneurship. My previous appointments had been either in economics departments or in sort of broad interdisciplinary social science departments where entrepreneurship was one of the phenomena of interest, but not the only one. And now I'm in a, a group that is much more dedicated and specialized in entrepreneurship. And I found that deeply rewarding. Uh, as Vishal mentioned, uh, I'm an editor with one of the leading entrepreneurship journals, the Strategic, Entre Strategic, Strategic Entrepreneurship Journal. Um, I've also been involved with the Academy of Management and am this year what they call the past chair, meaning that last year I was chair of the entrepreneurship division of AOM, and I'd be happy to give you some insight into how things work there as well. I'm also very interested in public policy. Uh, earlier in my career, I was a senior economist in the, in the White House and the Bill Clinton administration on the Council of Economic Advisors, and I've been thinking a lot ever since about how public policy can make entrepreneurship uh, better, how, how, how entrepreneurship can work better. Um, as you already have heard, my background is in economics. Well, it turns out that uh, entrepreneurship did play a prominent role in entrepreneurship thinking from the earliest foundations of the discipline, going back to Richard Cantillon's book published in 1755, which is probably the first systematic treatise in economics, through about the middle of the 20th century. Entrepreneurship was something that was of great interest to economists. And many of the great economists that you've heard of, like Schumpeter and Knight, uh, wrote treatises on entrepreneurship and the role it plays in, in the economy and in society. But uh, starting in the second half of the 20th century, uh, the entrepreneur really sort of dropped out of the conversation in most of economics. Partly this is methodological because of the increasing emphasis on sort of formal mathematical modeling of equilibrium states in which there is no role for the entrepreneur to play. Uh, the emphasis on perfectly competitive models of firms and industries and so forth led to uh, a state of affairs in which a famous uh, scholar, William Baumol, described the entrepreneur as the specter which haunts economic models. A specter is another word for a ghost. So the idea was that economists know that entrepreneurship is somehow important in the world, but they don't know how to incorporate entrepreneurship into their models, so they just ignore it. They just pretend that it doesn't exist. Uh, well, that's, that's obviously not a good thing for economics. Now, within management or business administration, you know, there's been interest in innovation for a long time, certainly since the 1950s, but really it was only in the 1970s and 80s that entrepreneurship began uh, to be studied more systematically. Uh, the entre there was an entrepreneurship interest group established in 1974, and entrepreneurship became a division of AOM in 86. It's now the third largest division within the Academy of Management. And several universities, starting with Harvard in the early 80s, established entrepreneurship programs. And as I said before, almost every university now has some kind of an entrepreneurship program. Um, so what is the thing that we're interested in? And, and what is this particular approach that I call the judgment-based approach to entrepreneurship? I'll just sketch out a few of its basic features here and hopefully uh, uh, stimulate your interest uh, for further study. Um, it, it, it's called the judgment-based approach because, the, uh, because it builds on a notion that comes out of Frank Knight's famous book, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit published in 1981. Knight, of course, is well known for his study of uncertainty or his way of conceiving uncertainty as distinct from probabilistic risk. And uh, some of my colleagues and I have argued that Knight's notion of uncertainty, what we call Knightian uncertainty, has been underappreciated in the entrepreneurship literature and needs to be brought front and center to the study of entrepreneurship. So what we call the judgment-based approach uh, takes as fundamental uh, Knight's, Knight's ideas about uncertainty and also related ideas about the heterogeneity of resources used in, in production and also the importance of competition as a mechanism for uh, uh, sorting out uh, uh, differences among uh, entrepreneurs who are more or less skilled at dealing with uncertainty. 
So judgment, as that term is used by Knight and by other scholars, can be described, if you like, as sort of decision-making about the future in the absence of a formal model or decision rule. So in other words, if you're throwing dice and you need to make some decision based on the likelihood that you'll no roll a number three when you, when you throw the die, um, we have very uh, clear ways of analyzing or parameterizing that problem. Right, if it's a normal die, we know that the likelihood that you'll roll a number three is one sixth. And so a any rational decision maker, based on their preferences over expected return, their willingness to bear risk, can make an informed decision because we all know and we all agree that the likelihood that a number three will come up is one sixth. However, in dealing with many aspects of human life, including much of what we know about businesses, and future profitability and consumer demand about products and services that have not yet been introduced, in those conditions, we don't have access to a formal probability model. So we cannot make decisions about what to do uh, in, in the uncertain future using that same kind of logic. Rather, we have to rely on alternative means of grappling with the uncertain future. Uh, if you like, you could call it intuition, right? Or gut feeling. The Germans have a great term for this, verstehen, which is usually translated into English as understanding, but really means a very sort of deep and intuitive, subjective and tacit belief, set of beliefs about the future. So given that uh, we do live in a world of naive and uncertainty, entrepreneurs must rely on their intuition or gut feeling. In other words, entrepreneurs must exercise judgment in making investment decisions and making production decisions and in hiring and writing business plans and so forth in anticipation of future profits that may or may not materialize, okay? Uh, there's a line from Knight's book, uh, Risk, Uncertainty and Profit, where Knight says the following, the only risk which leads to a profit is a unique uncertainty resulting from an exercise of ultimate responsibility which in its very nature cannot be insured, nor capitalized, nor salaried. You may have heard of Knightian uncertainty before, described as uninsurable risk, as opposed to insurable risk, which applies in cases where we do have sort of mathematical probabilities that we can agree on. So what Knight means is, in order to earn a profit, uh, entrepreneurs must uh, deal not only with that kind of risk, but also with these deep uncertainties that result in an exercise of ultimate responsibility, which cannot be insured against. In other words, for Knight, the exercise of entrepreneurial judgment is deeply associated with ownership of resources. In other words, taking the ultimate responsibility, making the ultimate decisions about how these resources will, de will be deployed under conditions of uncertainty. And we think this approach to entrepreneurship helps to develop links between entrepreneurship and resources which of course is important for strategy, for governance, uh, for innovation, and the ownership of companies, the ownership of firms, the ownership of industries, and so forth. Now, do note that proximate decision authority, day-to-day -day decision authority can be delegated by entrepreneurs, by owners to professional managers, but the ultimate decisions about, for example, which professional managers to hire and fire, uh, when to rely on the uh, judgments of professional managers, right? Those decisions cannot be delegated to anyone other than owners or the ownership group. In the words of uh, the German economist Ludwig, Ludwig, uh, Ludwig Lachmann, uh, we are living in a world of unexpected change, i.e. naive and uncertainty. Hence, capital combinations, resource combinations, will be ever-changing, will be dissolved and reformed. In this activity, we find the real function of the entrepreneur. So as uh, I've descri described in several works, including uh, a 2012 book called Organizing Entrepreneurial Judgment, the real function of the entrepreneur can be understood as this constant combining and recombining of valuable resources, heterogeneous capital resources under conditions of uncertainty in an attempt to earn profit and to avoid loss. Now, as I said before, some of my thinking on this topic was stimulated by reflecting on other approaches in the entrepreneurship literature. Probably the best known approach uh, associated with people like Israel Kirzner and Scott Shane 
is sometimes described as the opportunity discovery approach in which entrepreneurship is modeled as alertness to or the discovery of unrealized opportunities to earn profit, opportunities that are themselves exogenously created. They sort of exist out there in the landscape waiting for someone to stumble upon them. Now, there have been a number of critiques of the opportunity discovery approach offered in the last 10, 15 years. Um, what, what, what I call the ontological critique associated with uh, the opportunity creation school and some of the social constructivist approaches argues that the opportunity dis discovery approach uh, misunderstands the nature of reality, that it's not the case that profit opportunities are just sitting out there waiting for us to discover them. Rather, we have to create them endogenously through our own choices, through our own actions, through our own behaviors. And I think there's a lot of merit to that critique. There's also a parallel complementary critique that I call the cognitive critique associated with the effectuation and bricolage approaches, which say that uh, opportunity discovery is not the right way of describing what entrepreneurs actually do. Entrepreneurs don't think about discovering a gap and then rushing in to fill it. Rather, they think sort of incrementally and with a limited horizon. When they begin engaging in entrepreneurship, they don't really even know exactly what they're going to end up doing. They're just sort of making the best out of uh, what they can do now using resources currently at hand. Um, I would describe uh, my own critique, and I guess you've read about it a little bit in that 2015 paper that you was, was distributed before, is sort of a methodological critique, namely arguing that the opportunity construct itself is misleading, and that rather than uh, challenge it by by saying, well, let's assume that opportunities are created rather than discovered, we think you can dispense with the opportunity construct altogether and just describe entrepreneurs as taking actions to try to bring about future states of the world that they desire. Those actions include creating companies, creating products, changing companies, revising products and so forth, but uh, th there's really no opportunity out there. There are just the actions that entrepreneurs take and the results that obtain under conditions of uncertainty, and then what entrepreneurs learn uh, from those experiences. And I've got a, a piece that was in uh, Academy of Management Perspective called uh, Entrepreneurial Opportunities, Who Needs Them, which elaborates on this critique. The answer to who needs them is nobody, but you can read more about it in that particular paper. Okay, I want to um, I want to turn us over to, to questions. Um, let me make just a couple of remarks about some current projects that myself and other colleagues are working on in this, in this tradition within the so-called judgment-based approach. Some scholars are working at understanding the nature of uncertainty better. Others are trying to unpack the cognitive and behavioral foundations of entrepreneurial judgment. But let me just note the caveat, right, that because judgment is defined as decision-making under conditions in which we do not have a formal model of exactly what the entrepreneur is doing, exactly how we should deal with that uncertainty, you know, there's sort of built-in limits to the extent to which we can really understand what judgment is. The more we can understand it and break it down and dimensionalize it and parameterize it and model it, the more it becomes rational decision-making rather than intuition or first day in, okay? Um, as I mentioned before, in this approach, entrepreneurship is linked closely to ownership. And so some of the other research in this tradition is about of the relationship between uncertainty, entrepreneurship, and ownership. Uh, the paper that came out in uh, 2021 in uh, SMJ called Ownership Competence that lays out uh, a, a research agenda along, this lines, along these lines in, in more detail. Um, I think there's also some implications to be worked out on issues like CSR and social responsibility and stakeholder theory. And I have a book chapter uh, called Stakeholders and Corporate Social Responsibility and Ownership Perspective. I think that came out in 2018 or 2019. Uh, sorry, 2018, uh, which, which suggests that uh, once you understand idea of uncertainty and entrepreneurial judgment, seriously, it, it, it makes you um, a little bit more cautious about broadening the set of decision makers for firms to include non-owner stakeholders. Uh, for reasons that were sort of sketched out by the great legal theorist Henry Hansman, 
uh, many years ago, but I think uh, can be built upon and, and strengthened with reference to the judgment-based approach. Okay, so just to, to, to stop here and throw it open to some questions, entrepreneurship is a, is a growing and exciting field, but you know, again, there's little consensus on some of these sort of meta-theoretical issues. So, I mean, I'll be honest, the approach that I'm pushing and then I've described for you today, the judgment-based approach is by no means the dominant one within the entrepreneurship field. But to me, that's that's very exciting. It gives me an opportunity to to stand to sit before you and to preach, you know, preach my message here and to argue with people at conferences and and have a lot of fun. Um, you know, maybe the field will change and move more in that direction in the next few years. I don't know. But the fact that unlike some other academic fields we lack a comprehensive, overarching, universally agreed upon framework, to me is a feature, not a bug. It means that young scholars like yourselves uh, have a lot of areas where you can plug in and challenge the status quo and make your own unique contributions. I, having said that, I mean, my advice for early career scholars is, you know, to understand these sort of big, big debates, but not necessarily to try to make a contribution to them right away. In other words, focus on asking specific research question and providing answers, dealing with empirical phenomena of interest, trying to explain them. You can touch on, for example, the dispute between opportunity discovery and opportunity creation, or the dispute between judgment and effectuation. Uh, that's fine, but I wouldn't build my career, especially around un un unpacking those puzzles now, because that's really, it's easier to do that once you have a little bit of experience under your belt. Um, and Vishal mentioned just before I started the importance of disciplinary training. I would echo that very much. Um, you know, understand one or more core academic disciplines as well as you can and try to apply best practices both substantively and methodologically from those disciplines to study what you're interested in. And, and finally, do engage with practitioners and with policymakers and with entrepreneurship training. A lot of our best ideas in developing theories and cutting edge empirical research on entrepreneurship comes from engaging with practitioners and understanding what they think is important, what they think they're doing, and what they think they're missing in terms of you know, needing a better understanding. So, uh, Vishal, that's all I had prepared uh, uh, for uh, formal remarks, but I'm happy to spend some time with questions and comments and discussions. Thank you, Peter. Let me start with the first question, a simple one, and then we'll open the floor to others for questions. You mentioned Frank Knight's book. As someone who's, you know, chaired the PhD program at Bailiff in entrepreneurship research, as someone who's worked with a lot of junior scholars, do you recommend that junior scholars read original foundational works? Well, that's a great question. Um, so ideally, yes, I think some engagement with the classics, right, from Frank Knight or Joseph Schumpeter or slightly more recent uh, writers, you know, Ludwig von Mises, uh, Israel Kirzner and so forth. I think that is healthy. Uh, at the same time, you know, PhD students have limited limited time and attention, and so these these are big, lengthy books, and it takes quite a bit of time to sort of work your way through them. So I think familiarity with the ideas in these books are important. Reading at least excerpts, I think, is important. Uh, I think the mistake you want to avoid is having the sort of dilettante. The dilettante's understanding where you try to throw in the occasional footnote to some grand scholarly tome, but if someone were to ask you, you know, press you for details, you would be completely lost. I think you want to avoid kind of, you know, ritual citation of some famous name just to, just to cite it. At the same time, you know, depending on the length of your doctoral program, ours is a four-year program, and so we want students to get involved in doing you know, dissertation level research as early in the program as we can, you know, if they spend weeks and months doing nothing but reading the classics, that may put them a little bit behind. So I would, or I would urge a middle course on that question. Thank you, Peter. Ozioma, you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you so much, Peter. I'll, I'll be um, Ozioma. I'm sitting in New York, but I'm actually getting my PhD at a university in Lisbon. Um, and so I've, I, this is the first time I've actually heard of this judgment-based approach. Um, a couple of, I guess, maybe weeks or a month ago, I went to the Entrepreneurship as Practice Conference, which was really fascinating. And so seeing that the unit of action, I mean, the unit of analysis or the unit of like, um, of what's being researched is 
posited as action and their similarity between entrepreneurship as practice and the focus on action and the rituals and the things that entrepreneurs actually do. I'm very interested in what are the correlations or what's the conversation between entrepreneurship as practice because that hasn't been mentioned as of yet. And is there a relationship or are there possibilities there? Right. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, thank you for the comment. Uh, I, I certainly do think there is a close relationship. In fact, I mean, while, while entrepreneurship, while, while practicing entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs, sorry, they, they do use opportunity language from time to time. What they really mean by opportunity is something like business plan. You know, here's the opportunity I'm presenting to the investors. Really what they mean is a description of the actions that they intend to take. I, I have another, in that AMP paper that I mentioned, uh, we, we describe a, a simple framework that we call BAR, beliefs, actions, and results. And we say that as, if you talk to entrepreneurs about what they think they are doing, if you talk to investors about entrepreneurship and, and what investors think they're supporting, when they provide resources to entrepreneurs. It's all about, okay, the entrepreneur's beliefs, vision, expectations about what will happen once I create my firm, once I introduce my product, once I expand this market. The, you know, here are the sales revenues I forecast. Here are the profits that I anticipate getting. Of course, at the moment of decision, those profits don't exist, right? They're just in my mind. I mean, they're, they're things that I hope eventually to uh, be able to uh, uh, obtain. In fact, it occurs to me, Michelle, if I still have screen sharing capability, uh, well, never mind. I, I'm, I'm afraid it'll take me too long to, to pull it up. Um, I actually have a, a little diagram that sort of lays this out. Um, so you have, oh, the entrepreneurs, <laughs> you have the entrepreneur's beliefs about the future, uh, which are based on current knowledge, knowledge of the past, some scientific and technical knowledge, based on those beliefs, the entrepreneur takes some action to, you know, to launch or not to launch, to expand or not to expand, to develop the product or not to develop the product. And then there's some results, right? There's like, if you think of it, you know, there's the entrepreneur's imagined future. This is what will happen after I engage in these actions. And there's, then there's the actual future, which can sometimes diverge substantially from the entrepreneur's expectations. You know, if those two happen to be perfectly aligned, the entrepreneur anticipated the future correctly, the result is profitability and growth and all kinds of wonderful outcomes. And the entrepreneur can then go back in the next period and, and repeat the same set of behaviors or maybe make some changes for incremental improvements. But of course, many times reality turns out differently from what we expected. So, so if there's if there's a gap there, the result, of course, is uh, it, it can be loss or you know frustration, disappointment. Uh, the entrepreneur then has a choice, right? The entrepreneur can try to learn from from th that, that those results, right? Why did reality turn out differently from what I expected? Was my technology not the right one? Did I misunderstand what my competitor responses would be? Was there something about, uh, you know, the regulatory environment that I didn't anticipate that changed? Okay, and then based on that, the entrepreneur can revise his or her plans and engage in a, another round of action, or maybe just decide entrepreneurship is not for me. Or maybe if you've run out of capital at that stage, you're forced to pursue some, something other than entrepreneurship. But this constant, you know, re re revision, this constant cycle of forming beliefs, taking actions based on those beliefs, then making adjustments based on the results. That's really what practitioners do. And that's what they understand themselves to be doing. And we think our beliefs, actions, results framework nicely sort of encapsulates that. I'll look for the little picture and see if I can see if I can pull it that, up. That being said, would I, be able, would I be able to reach out to you? Because like, I'm actually researching the role that vision plays in the early nascent stages of how those judgments are made using experience sampling methodologies and interviews and et, et cetera. So I would love to be able to, sure. to yeah. understand and gain more clarity. In Absolutely. Opinion. Yes. I'm happy to, happy to have that conversation at any time. Okay. Awesome. Peter, in the so interest much. of time, let's move to the next question from Neeraj. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Peter, I just, uh, I was looking into the classics before and I was trying to link between them and, uh, uh, there are two strands like discovery approach and the creation approach for the entrepreneurship. Uh, means uh, opportunity discovery and creation of the opportunity. There's two strands. And if I would like to make link with the judgment-based approach and uh, the work of uh, Knight, 
so in that if we see uh, the judgment in the uh, discovery opportunity discovery is more associated with risk and in terms of uh, uh, creating opportunity is more the judgment is more associated with uh, uncertainty so uh, do you think it is right. the, the right means i'm thinking right or something yeah yeah so i wouldn't disagree entirely with that but i would frame it in a slightly different way i think the issue with opportunity discovery is not that it is paying more attention to probabilistic risk than to 90 and uncertainty but rather that it really isn't considering either risk or uncertainty in the sense that in the opportunity discovery approach you know profitability you know it's just sort of floating out there in the world someone is going to stumble upon it sooner or later uh, you know the metaphor is like you know the lost luggage at the airport i mean the lost luggage is sitting there whether the passenger comes to pick it up or not and if you don't eventually pick it up maybe somebody else will come and get it or they'll give it away or whatever but but to, to, to the way that metaphor would apply they would say is you know i don't know apple in uh you know steve jobs in the early 2000s you know has this vision in his mind of an iphone right uh, or rather they would say steve jobs was the first to realize to recognize that you could build a device with certain properties uh with certain technology embedded in it sell it at a certain price point you could offer that to the market you could become you know and you could you could be hugely successful in doing that if steve jobs hadn't figured it out somebody else would have come along and figured it out in other words, in you know 2004 or five, let's say, all of the income earned from selling iPhones in 2010 already existed somehow metaphorically, just waiting for the first person to discover it. The, the problem that the judgment-based approach has with that is that we say no. I mean, uh, you know, at the time that those decisions were made to construct that device and sell it, no one knew whether it would be profitable or not. And of course, you know, if, if profit opportunities are just sitting out there waiting for someone to discover them, how do we then explain firms that are in losses? I mean, how do you discover a loss, right? I mean, what happens, and of course this has happened many times even for companies like Apple, right? You know, when Apple introduced the Newton, which was a handheld electronic device in the early 2000s that attempted to compete with the Palm Pilot, the younger people on the call are wondering what the heck are these things, but you can look them up on Wikipedia. You know, that was a massive fail for Apple. And you could say, well, you know, how, why didn't Apple discover the profits that could be earned from selling the Newton? No, what happened is Apple thought people would buy the Newton introduce the product. People would not, in fact, buy it because it wasn't a good product, and Apple lost a lot of money on that. So there was no, there was nothing to discover at that point. Profitability doesn't exist waiting for someone to find it. It is the, it, 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 you know, it may or may not come about as the result of actions that people take in the present to try to bring about outcomes they desire. Peter, we'll move Thanks. to Fred Thanks, for his question. Fred? Uh, yes, thank you. So uh, I also discovered. I'm sorry, Fred. I'm having a little difficulty hearing you. I don't know if others are experiencing that. Also, I think your microphone might be not working correctly. Is it better now? Yes, now it's better. Okay, cool. So thank you for for the presentation. And for me, also, it was a discovery uh, to uh, the the judgment based approach. And I would like to know what's your point of view or. How do you relate uh, this approach with entrepreneurial cognition and uh, this well frame, uh, frame in the literature? Yeah, I, I think it's complementary to and consistent with a lot of the work that is being done in the cognition area. So understanding, you know, how do entrepreneurs attempt to grapple with deep uncertainty? How do they form judgments? Is it primarily, you know, based on experience? Is it using metaphor and analogy? I'm also very interested in ways that entrepreneurs attempt to convince other potential stakeholders that the entrepreneur's beliefs about the future are reasonable to get those entrepreneurs to invest or to participate, to join the founding team, et cetera. So we you can look at you know, strategies for persuasion, right? Do we use rhetoric? Do we use uh, sense-making? How do we attempt to understand 
possible futures, not only for ourselves, but also for other potential partners. I think the cognitive and behavioral literature is very much an important input into that. Although just to, to uh, restate just a caveat from before, I think there are limits to the extent to which we can unpack the true nature of intuitive judgment, because again, it's, it's sort of, uh, uh, I guess it's ironic the more we attempt to understand judgment, the better we do understand it, the less it is judgment and the more it is something else, just like, you know, behavior that is rational in some broader sense that once we take certain cognitive biases into account, you know, again, we can therefore predict exactly what the actor will do. That was the key point for Knight. If everyone had the same beliefs about the future, everyone could predict the future equally well, then it would be, there would be no way to earn a profit because all your competitors would be doing exactly the same thing that you're doing, right? Profits result from these idiosyncratic beliefs about the future. Now, why does one entrepreneur have a belief about the future that's different from that of other entrepreneurs? We can try to understand that as best we can, but ultimately at the end of the day, some of that is gonna be a kind of a residual, right? It's something tacit and just too difficult for us to uh, break down and dimensionalize. Peter, I know we've already passed the 40 minute mark with you, but we have three, four other hands up. Are you willing to take more questions? Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm fine to stay on as long as, as long as you need. Arpita, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Peter. My question is somewhat uh, similar with Fred, but I would like to ask again for my bit of understanding. So if I uh, see this approach and try to fit in, in theory of effectuation, so uh, when I'm doing the crazy quilt or patchwork, uh, am I making the judgment by selecting whom to bring to my uh, company? Or when I'm talking about pilot in the plane, ultimately deciding what to do, you know, lemonade if something is coming, which one should I, I'm pivoting and discussing with people, finally deciding the lemonade. So uh, starting a bit different, starting from night, then we're discovering, but in the middle, somewhat it is similar. Am yeah. I understanding so, correctly? Yes, I mean, my view, which might not be exactly the same as Saris's view, is that these are different ways of approaching the same basic problem, right? So in my mind, the sort of techniques that Saris has developed are, are, are you know, ways of understanding how do entrepreneurs go about formulating potential, how do they identify actions that they want to take? Right. So, you know, they have some vague and possibly not fully fleshed out set of beliefs about things that might happen in the future. How do they how do they obtain a better understanding? Well, they do so by experimentation, by taking incremental action. Right. Maybe by utilizing the crazy quilt approach or whatever, whatever it might be. I think where where there's been some miscommunication between these two different uh, camps or approaches, if you like, is that. Um, you know, there's a problem with the, the, the word judgment, the, the English use of the word judgment, right? Um, because that word is used both to describe, you know, the action of judging, right? But also it sometimes has a sense of, uh, you know, making good judgments. You know, we, we say someone has, uh, you know, judgment is associated with wisdom or prudence or, you know, think about, I don't know if any of you have been following political controversies in the U.S., there's this big deal about uh, a leaked draft of a, draft of a Supreme Court opinion. Okay, so what does a judge do in a court hearing? A judge makes a judgment, right? The judge renders an opinion. Now, usually we think that, right, in, in most cultures, who gets to be a judge? Well, someone who, you know, it has a lot of wisdom and someone who has experience and someone who isn't just going to rush out and make some crazy decision, but is thoughtful and reflective and so forth. So, you know, but we often think the decision made by the judge is wrong. If we're on the losing side of a dispute, we almost certainly think the judge made the wrong decision. So a judgment can be incorrect and some people can exercise in judgment, but not be very good at it. I think where there's some misunderstanding is in the uh, effectuation, within the effectuation community, I think there's a, there's a, a belief that the judgment-based approach assumes that judgments are always good, right? That when entrepreneurs are forming these beliefs about the future, the beliefs are really sound and well thought out and very clear and, and you're more often, more likely to be correct 
than incorrect, but that isn't the claim at all. I mean, some people may be terrible at exercising judgment, but may still give it a shot. Now, final point, if you think about this from a more macro point of view, right, is it likely in a competitive market situation that people who are systematically, consistently, persistently poor at exercising judgment about the future will we'll continue to be entrepreneurs for very long? Well, probably not. I mean, they're probably going to run out of capital at some point. So, so we would expect that competition would tend to sort of reward those who are better than average at judgment and penalize those who are worse than average. So yeah, we wouldn't expect a world in which most of the people making judgments you know, about big investments of resources are just consistently horrible at it. Right? But, but that is a result of us thinking through empirically what competition does, theoretically and empirically what competition does. It's not an assumption of the judgment-based approach that the entrepreneur knows exactly what he or she wants to accomplish and has this perfectly... No, remember, judgment is just taking action without a precise formal model of what could likely happen. You may have a very well-formed intuitive judgment, but you may have a very loosely formed intuitive judgment. But the point is something has to be motivating that action. Whatever that is, is what we're going to call judgment. Thanks, Peter. Audra, you want to go next? Yeah, I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to try to keep it succinct. I do have kind of two points, and one of them I think bridges beautifully from the previous question and what you were just saying about the fact that judgment is not always good, you know, and I think you make that point well in the paper, but it occurs to me that and I wonder if you know, the outcome of judgment, which is learning, you know, if that's the, where the real entrepreneurial breakthroughs take place. And, and I wonder your thoughts about how you're distinguishing judgment from learning in terms of, you know, most entrepreneurs, I think, would say, I've made some very, very poor judgments, but it was because I had the bravery to go out and test them and to persevere through, um, you know, that I I made it. Yeah, you know, the, it, it's a great question. I mean, I think learning, so Two ways to answer. So the act of judging, the, the act of engaging in judgment doesn't require learning because, you know, you could do it once and that's it, right? I mean, I try it once and either I'm spectacularly successful or I'm a horrible failure and that's it. Then I go on to do something else. That's the end of my entrepreneurial journey. I mean, again, in principle, one could engage in the act of judging without learning from one's mistakes. Or here's another example. You know, I just keep doing the same thing over and over again, even though it fails every time, but for whatever reason, I'm stubborn or I'm not capable of changing my behavior. I mean, that could happen in principle. But now if we want to talk about understanding the entrepreneurial process, then, then learning is, is a very important part of that, right? If by process, we mean revision, right? So making, exercising judgment, taking action based on that judgment, looking at the results and then revising one's behavior, whether making small tweaks or, or even extensively revising that behavior, then, then learning, the ability to learn, the quality of learning is an important part of that process being successful, right? So there's, there's another kind of related approach. I would call it part of the judgment-based approach more generally, although they use slightly different language. As some of the papers by Teppo Feline and Todd Zenger on uh, entrepreneurs, and they've got some on strategists too, uh, engaging in sort of theory is what they call it, theorizing, that the entrepreneur or the strategic decision maker is like a theorist. Here they have in mind this sort of, you know, Popperian notion of formulating a hypothesis and then testing it against the evidence. And so in their metaphor, the entrepreneur has some beliefs, they call it a theory of value creation, you test that theory in the marketplace by creating a company or introducing a product or whatever, and then you get feedback on your theory, and then you revise your theory, you know, with Bayesian learning or something like that. In my mind, that is perfectly consistent with the judgment-based approach as a more overarching kind of framework. That's one way we might conceptualize how the learning process take place, but I'm sort of agnostic. There may be other ways of understanding learning as well that are also consistent with this more general framework. In the interest of time, Peter, we'll move to the next uh, audience member. Joel, you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Peter, I, I've read several of your papers on the judgment-based approach and on opportunity. And this is kind of like one of the things I've struggled with since the very beginning of that. Um, so if we think of opportunity not as the profit itself, 
but rather is the potential for that profit, uh, which is dependent upon beliefs and knowledge and actions and capabilities and all those other things. Like, isn't the opportunity concept useful to describe the and examine the external conditions that, that are related to that potential profit generation? Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a good or question. Not what else does it, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Look, to some extent, this is just a semantic issue, right? So Per Davidson, for example, calls the things that you're talking about external enablers, right. right? So it's not the profit per se, but it's a set of conditions that make profitability more likely. That's totally fine. In fact, if you look at an English language dictionary, right, the dictionary definition, definition of opportunity is always in relationship to some external objective factors. You know, we're taking a walk through the park and there's a bench there that someone has built. You know, the, the, the presence of a bench gives us an opportunity to sit down and rest, right? So it's not fully socially constructed, right? There is something objective in the external world that makes it possible for us to achieve the goal of resting that otherwise would be more difficult for us to achieve because we'd have to sit on the ground. I mean, I obviously that... that that those kinds of things are important to entrepreneurs. You know, if I'm in the technology sector, the fact that the internet exists and that, you know, I can communicate, I can, my, my device can communicate over certain frequencies and using certain protocols, that is a, an objective feature of reality that is useful to me. Um, so can you I'm, point to where that's talked about in the judgment-based approach though? Like where, where do you address any of these external Issues. Yeah. So, so in if you look at what we call the beliefs, actions, results framework, which I described before, right? So part of uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm looking, I'm trying to talk and look for a diagram at the same time, but I probably shouldn't do that. Um, uh, what we say is, you know, on what basis are the entrepreneurs' beliefs about the future, beliefs about the uncertain f future, formed? What's feeding into that? Well, part of it is objective conditions of reality, right? Like the ones we're talking about. Uh, now those have to be, in, are subject to interpretation, of course, right? They have to be processed through a human mind to, to determine whether they're relevant or not. You know, things that happened in the past. There are my beliefs about sort of present consumer preferences and so forth. So what Davidson calls external enablers feed into my formulation of judgments about the future. Right, I'm also making those judgment based on judgments based on my beliefs about you know uh, what I think this future state of the world will be like. What will objective reality look like in the future? Will there be a technological advance between now and when my product comes to market? How will my competitors react? What will consumers want? What will the policy environment be? Will COVID have happened? Will the world be in a recession? Will there be a war in Ukraine? Right, all of those things. My beliefs about those things also feed into my beliefs about the future. And based on those beliefs, I act. So absolutely, you know, current technological conditions and other sort of objective features are part of the information or knowledge that the entrepreneur uses to formulate those beliefs. If that's all we mean by opportunity, then fine. I have no problem using that word, but that isn't what people in the entrepreneurship literature seem to mean by opportunity. They seem to mean, again, the way Scott Shane uses that term, is that the opportunity is the profitability that is just waiting for the first person to come along and find. Peter, do we have Thank time you. for two more questions? I have as much time as you want, but I don't know what's next on your schedule. Yeah, so we'll, if, yeah, Junho, go ahead. We'll finish with these two questions and then we'll call it a day. Appreciate it. So, um, yeah. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I relate to the, uh, now I relate to the needs for the judgment based view now. And uh, so I also, but at the same time, I also would like to know what has been the strongest critique for the judgment based view. So one concern I have come up with in my mind is about the boundaries of entrepreneurial activity when we define entrepreneurial activities um, according with the kind of judgment based view. So. My concern is some of activities might not be different from, some of entrepreneurial activities might not be different from um, risk-taking activities in nature organizations or some judgments in managerial stuff that would not be uh, different from judgments on uh, managerial stuff in the nature firm. So um, do you have any clear boundaries between those two activities in natured ones and nascent firms? Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure if I completely understand uh, the question 
Jin Hu. Yeah, I don't think, you know, if the question is, does, is there, what is the scope of applicability of this framework? In fact, we think it's an advantage of the judgment-based approach, other, other over frameworks, that it applies very broadly, including to firms at different stages of the life cycle. So one very interesting thing about, again, Vishal asked the opening question about reading the classics. If you read Knight, if you read Schumpeter, if you read Mises, if you read even Kersner and so forth, these, uh, you know, there's no, no reference whatsoever in these, in these very thoughtful treatments of entrepreneurship to startups. I mean, it's not about startups at all. It's not about self-employment. It's not about gazelles. It's not about firms with 10x, you know, growth potential. It's about, it's about firms of all kinds, right? It's how do, how do human beings engage in an uncertain world, right? And so, in effect, we're all entrepreneurial in every day and everything that we do because we have to make some commitments. We have to take some actions without knowing for certain what the results of those things will be. Now, if we're in, interested in, you know, sort of commercial entrepreneurship, then we would limit our, our uh, discussion to uh, individuals and groups who, who engage in sort of full-time professional pursuit of financial gain, the desire to avoid financial loss, you know, by buying and selling resources and markets and so forth. But again, that domain is not limited to early stage ventures. It would apply also to mature companies as well. And you could say that existing companies in deciding, you know, whether to introduce a you know, whether to change their product portfolio, whether to vertically integrate or not, whether to diversify or really, you know, any sort of strategic decision that they are making under conditions of uncertainty. You know, they're also making judgments right about the future. Now, we often say, many people say in trying to put, you know, sort of boundaries on these things, okay, yeah, but if you're operating in the textile industry or the steel industry or the automobile industry or energy sector or pick whatever, you know, mature industry you want, well, then the level of nighty and uncertainty is low compared to in the startup world with, you know, radical new technologies and so forth. Then the level of nighty and uncertainty is high. So judgment is more relevant in the second case, less relevant in the first case, because they can rely on just sort of routine heuristics and algorithms and so forth. I mean, I sort of get that point. But if you really think about it deeply, I think it's very tough to draw that line because, I mean, look at all the examples I just mentioned. I mean, automobiles, energy, steel, all of those industries are, are experiencing rapid disruption and technological change. And it's hard for me to come up with any example of a business decision which really can be made in terms of pure probabilistic risk. There's no deep uncertainty about future market conditions. I mean, I, I really can't think of, of, of any at all. But, but to answer your question, one criticism of our approach has been that it doesn't, it's, it's too broad, right? It applies to everything. It doesn't apply only to a specific kind of firm in a specific kind of circumstance, you know, to which I say, okay, well, I mean, if that's a, a flaw, then I'm willing to live with that flaw because, you know, we're just sort of trying to build out the ideas and take them wherever they go. And again, we see that as a, as a feature, not a bug. James, you get the last qu audience question. Oh, thank you very much. I'll build on um, Hayden's question. Um, so given the entrepreneur's um, comfort with uncertainty uh, or this new kind of uncertainty uh, in making judgment, um, do you have any new insight or um, uh, perspective on uh, teaching entrepreneurship. So I'm a longtime practitioner, recent uh, academic research, completed my doctorate um, uh, in economics right before COVID. So now as I look ahead, um, how do I help uh, instill uh, or bring some of this theory um, to bear for, especially undergraduates or teaching entrepreneurship? And I know you have some background there and have written several papers. So I'd love to get any new epiphanies, any new insight or guidance. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know that I have any epiphanies, but I mean, I do think one of the strengths uh, of the particular approach that I'm describing is that it is 
and as we discussed in the with previous question, a previous question, very, very, very relevant to practice. And I think I think it 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 lends itself naturally to a classroom discussions, case studies, examples, uh, experiments about what entrepreneurs actually do. Right. So, what what are some of the techniques that we teach? Well, we teach scenario analysis. Right. We teach talk about brainstorming, we walk through the steps of the entrepreneurial process. In fact, I think a simple framework like beliefs, actions, results, again, look at that uh, Academy of Management perspective paper for a little bit more detail on that. I think that lends itself very naturally to a classroom discussion or a discussion with practitioners because that's exactly what they understand themselves to be doing. So when we ask our students to put together a business plan, whether we do business planning or not, uh, even if we're embracing a sort of a lean approach, whatever is that initial set of conjectures, right? If we develop a product or a, a service like this, we think it will fit this market need and we think consumers will be willing to pay this price for it. You know, how does one come up with that particular idea, vision, set of beliefs, et cetera? That is the thing about which the entrepreneurs or prospective entrepreneurs are exercising judgment. So we can talk about on what basis did you come up with that idea? Is it reasonable, right? Again, sorry, this is a good chance for me to preach on another point. Um, and this is, James, you'll appreciate this as someone with an economics background. Um, you know, a lot of economists or a lot of social scientists think there are two kinds of decision-making. One is rational decision-making. You know, you're maximizing expected utility based on known information and blah, 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 blah. And the other kind of decision-making is blind guessing. And there's nothing in between. Okay, this is the notion that Frank Knight and the judgment-based approach rejects, right? Central to Knight's view is the idea that judgment or for staying or whatever you want to call it, it is rational in a sense. I mean, it's not just blind guesswork. It's not just throwing darts at a dartboard. There is something to it. I mean, it's based on a deep, tacit, subjective understanding of the world that while it cannot be parameterized in mathematics, or maybe even made explicit verbally, you know, there is something to it. It's like, you know, it's tacit knowledge, the knowledge of how to ride a bicycle. You know, that knowledge is in your brain. It is real. You do use it to ride a bike, but it's very difficult for you to make it explicit. You can't write down a set of steps that someone could read and instantly be able to ride a bike if they've never ridden one before. So, so what we do in the classroom is we help the students right? We help, help them think through uh, uh, on what basis did you make those conjectures about what the market for your product would be? Why did you choose the, that combination of attributes? Is it based on historical knowledge? Is it based on conversations with engineers? Is it based on focus groups? Is it based on my own experience as a student and what I would like to buy and I think other students would like to buy it? We can walk through sort of a set of tools and techniques that help you to form more reasonable sets of beliefs about the future. We can also, of course, talk about the learning process. Once you actually launch, you give it a shot, you give it a start, the results turn out differently from what you expected. Uh, how can you make sense of that data so that you can revise your plans and make a, a more reasonable judgment uh, the next time out? So, uh, James, I haven't written a textbook or a lot of explicit sort of classroom materials, but I do think this approach fits very nicely with what we like to do in the entrepreneurship classroom. Okay. In, the interest, in the interest of time, let me move this towards sort of the last phase, uh, which is what advice would you offer to people? If there's one advice you could offer to people who are new to entrepreneurship research or junior scholars sort of starting out their career, what's one advice you would offer? Ooh, one, I only get one piece of advice. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, look for research questions, research topics. And number one, questions that can be answered, right? Not the really big, deep philosophical things when you're just starting out, but research questions that could potentially have an answer, right? And, you know, uh, look for questions that meet, uh, you know, all three of the following criteria. Number one, you're really interested in this question. You really deeply want to find the answer to this question. That would get you very excited. You have some passion over this topic. That's number one. Number two, this is a kind of a question that could be answered, right? I mean, it, it's, it's doable. Research is potentially, you know, there's some way you could get at it. 
you have the they have the tools that are necessary if it's empirical the data exists potentially to answer this question and then number three the answer to this question would be interesting to to other people besides just you in other words this is going to be your dissertation topic or you're going to use this as a job market paper you know or you're going to use this to, to get a promotion or to try to get tenure whatever it should be something that is potentially interesting to the market right so if you think about drawing a venn diagram right here are all the here are all the research questions i'm interested in here are all the research questions that can be answered uh, that can you know i reasonably think can be answered here are all the research questions that the rest of the profession is excited about Hopefully you can find something to work on that's at the intersection of those three sets. Right now, a topic that is in one or two of those sets, but not all three, is better than a topic that is not in any of those sets. But if you can find something in that sweet spot, uh, then you're, you're best positioned to have success. Now, Peter, as we come to the end of this session, would you be willing to connect with folks here, anyone who wants to connect with you on LinkedIn, wants to send you an email with questions, would you be willing to do that? Yeah, I absolutely would. And you can find all my, if you just search for my name, Peter Klein Entrepreneurship, you'll get my website that has my email address and you can find my social media accounts. Happy to connect with you on any of those. But yeah, I'd be delighted to carry on the conversation uh, with any of you uh, uh, later. If you think of follow-up questions or you know other things you want to talk about down the road, be very happy to do that. So Peter, with that, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to our audience today. I found myself taking pages and pages of notes as you spoke. I am hopeful that others found the session as useful as I did. Uh, and I know we went past our this uh, the time that we'd committed, uh, but I enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure. Uh, best, best of success to all of you in your careers and hope you enjoy the rest of today's program. Bye, Peter. So I know, guys, we've, uh, we've already gone past that time a lot. So with that, I think it's best to finish today's session here. Uh, if you have questions, keep them. We'll answer them tomorrow. I promise I will manage time much better tomorrow than I did today. Uh, but uh, thank you very much. And uh, have a good rest of the day. If you are in the North America, have a good rest of the evening. If you are in Europe, have a good night. If you are in Asia, see you all tomorrow. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you sir.